Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Maria Montague. I'm the Deputy Director of the Ukrainian Institute London, a centre for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. We're an independent charity, so we're very grateful to all of you for booking a ticket for our event this evening. Ticket sales and donations are really important for us to keep going with our work. Um, so this evening's webinar is going to be moderated by Dr. Olesya Hromychuk. Olesya is the director of the Ukrainian Institute London and a historian of 20th century Eastern Central Europe. Olesya is also a theatre maker and she runs the Mordi Theatre in London. And um, she herself has written a documentary theatre based on true and personal stories, um, including related to the war in Ukraine. And you can find out more about Olesya's work um, on her website. And because of Olesya's work um, in documentary theatre and telling her own stories, stories through theatre, she's really well placed this evening to moderate our event on recovering family histories through different creative genres. And um, so that we keep going with our um, event this evening, I'll pass over to Olesya now. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I'm really, really uh, pleased to be able to moderate tonight's discussion. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Maria said, I'm a historian and I work on the complex history of East Central uh, Europe, uh, in particular the Second World War and Ukraine. Um, and so I know how hard it can be to navigate um, that field of history, even without having a personal connection uh, to the research topic. But having a personal connection um, adds a number of layers. Um, it makes you face stories that you might not be ready to face. Um, it makes you uncover untold, sometimes traumatic uh, facts about your loved ones. Um, it also makes you realize that family anecdotes might not necessarily match up with historical record. Uh, but the process of uncovering family histories is also very fulfilling, um, because through these family stories, we come to learn about our, our ancestors and about ourselves, and also about the context in which our families lived. It's also likely um, to make us think of the past, not in black and white colors, which is very tempting to do, but, uh, but in a variety of shades of gray, um, and therefore maybe come a bit closer to understanding um, the reality of the past. So as a historian, I've been approached by people trying to understand their family histories, um, often after their parents uh, have passed away and could not be approached for clarifications. And I could see how important it was for those people to restore their family archive, to fill the gaps. But I could also watch them sometimes having to come to terms with the fact that they might never learn the whole story that, um, you know, that some of these narratives will stay fragmented. Um, and um, it's one thing to collect these family stories for your own family, and it's another uh, to find the courage and the desire to share them more widely. So tonight we have speakers who went on a journey of discovering their family histories and decided to share them in a very creative way in a variety of different creative ways with others. And I'll speak about their projects themselves in a moment, but let me first introduce them. I'll introduce them one by one and then we'll begin the discussion. So uh, the first speaker will be Matthew Zajak, or perhaps I should say Matthew Zayats, or maybe Matthew Zions. <laughs> There you go. It really depends where you come from, what the, you know, the pronunciation that you choose for the name. And perhaps that in itself can give you a little flavor of the sort of complex identity um, and history issues that we'll be talking about today. So Matthew Z Zajak grew up in Inverness and he studied drama at Bristol University. He has worked as an actor for 39 years, appearing in theater throughout the UK and in numerous film and TV and radio productions. Um, Matthew has been artistic director of Dogstar Theatre Company since 2004, and the company tours um, across Scotland and internationally. And hopefully we'll continue touring when um, the restrictions are lifted and we'll get to see them in London. Uh, in recent years, Matthew became increasingly curious about his Ukrainian and Polish, the Ukrainian and Polish roots of his father, and dug deeper into his family history to discover that his father's past was a great deal more complicated than he had ever imagined. 
Matthew created a one-man show called The Tailor of Inverness, um, in which he explores his father's journey from war-torn Ukraine and Poland to the Scottish Highlands. And the show premiered in 2008 and has since toured internationally and was also performed in Ukraine. Uh, building on the success of this theatre production, Matthew also created a BBC documentary with filmmaker Brian Ross. Um, it was released in 2021 and published a book, uh, further exploring his search for um, the story about his father's past and his experience of travelling to Ukraine, uh, where he both shared his theatre production, but also was able to track down family that he never knew he had. Okay, our next speaker will be, will be Michael Sagatis. Michael is an independent researcher and filmmaker. He was born in the UK from Slavic and Baltic heritage. He has traveled and lived in former Soviet republics to premiere his documentary exhibition performance called Yusefa's Letters, Extraction from Oblivion, which tells the story of Michael's great grandmother who was exiled to a Soviet labor camp in Kazakhstan at the beginning of the Second World War. Michael produced and co-scored this documentary, uh, which has already received um, um, a number of official film festival selections and won best short film at the 2020 Eurasian Film Festival. Okay. Um, and so we also have with us father and daughter and co-authors of a family memoir, Denise and Anastasia Uhrin. Uh, Denise graduated from a medical school in Ukraine in 1998 and came to the UK um, to undertake his postgraduate training in child and adolescent psychiatry. Denise is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist and, uh, psychiatrist and a reader at the Institute of Psychiatry, uh, Psychology and Neuroscience. This, Denise is also one of the leaders of the Ukrainian Medical Association of the United Kingdom, uh, which developed develops ties and information exchange between academic and professional healthcare organizations in the UK and in Ukraine. Uh, Denise's main professional interests include uh, prevention of borderline personality disorder and effective um, interventions for self-harm. And outside of his professional work, Denise is an active member of the Ukrainian community in London, including um, the Ukrainian Scouts movement, PLAST. In 2020, Denis, together with his daughter Anastasia, co-authored a family memoir, 100 Years in Galicia, Events that Shaped Ukraine and Eastern Europe. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Anastasia, Denis's uh, daughter, Anastasia Ohren, she's a first year history student at uh, the University of St. Andrews, so probably my future colleague, uh, at least I hope so. She describes herself as the daughter of two Ukrainian immigrants, uh, she's particularly interested in 20th century history of the region, in particular Ukraine, and also Holodomor, the Ukrainian famine. And she's already received awards for the essays where she tackles this issue. So welcome, huge welcome to all of our speakers. Um, what an interesting collection that, you know, so many paths, um, I think, cross in these stories. Um, but also you, you still come to, to tell them from very different angles and, and you produce very different um, pieces of work in the end. And it'll be lovely to explore how you've come to, to make those decisions. I'm going to um, begin with a very simple question to start with. Not all of our viewers have seen your work or read, read it or watched it. Um, so please just briefly describe your projects. Um, so we, so we, you know, we know a bit more about them. Let's begin with Matthew. Matthew, can you tell us a little bit more about the Taylor of Inverness? Um yeah, I, I, well, I'll, I, I grew up in Inverness, which is a small town in the far north of Scotland, and um, uh, there were very few Poles uh, who were in Inverness uh, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, maybe 20 or so. Uh, so there wasn't really a, a Polish community as such. It wasn't a big enough community for there to be a Saturday school um, or uh, uh, anything like that. There were a few more poles uh, a bit north of Inverness, a place called Invergordon, and a lot of them had actually been stationed in uh, in Invergordon during the war. They were poles who'd managed to escape uh, from the clutches of the Nazis and the Soviets as they um, invaded and uh, occupied uh, Poland in 1939. Um, so, uh, um, although I was aware of the fact that I had a Polish father uh, uh, growing up. It didn't feature hugely in my life, uh, except for every two years when we would drive from Inverness to Poland uh, uh, to visit my dad's brother. 
and that was obviously a very significant uh, uh, event. We it would take us about a month, the whole the whole trip, three or four days to drive there, three or four days coming back, and we'd stay there for three or four weeks while we were there. And they were absolutely wonderful holidays. And of course, I got a, a real kind of injection of of uh, the culture of Poland uh, um, uh, when I did that. And uh, um, I, as I became an adult, I, I understood that my father had uh, had a, a quite an interesting life. Uh, and when I was in my late twenties, when I, I really started to get a bit more interested in that, uh, I thought maybe I should uh, maybe one day create something from it. But I didn't know what. What I started, what I did in 1988, when I was 29, was that I recorded uh, interviews with my father after some persuasion about his life. Uh, he died a few years later. Um, it took me a few years after that to actually uh, listen to the tapes. Um, uh, I decided at that point to transcribe them because I thought I'd write a book. Um, and when I listened to the tapes and transcribed them, I noticed that there were a number of uh, inconsistencies with dates and places, which made me curious and eventually led me to deciding that I had to go to his birthplace, which is now in Western Ukraine, was part of Poland before the Second World War. Um, I uh, visited an aunt in Poland in 2002. She told me that there was a cousin of my father's still alive in uh, Podhaitse, which is the town where my father trained to be a tailor, about 10 kilometers from his village. And uh, um, uh, so I wrote to him, I visited there in 2003, uh, and I discovered on that trip, um, to be brief, that the story my father told me of his journey from Galicia uh, to ultimately Inverness wasn't entirely true. There were a number of inconsistencies, there were a number of things which he had concealed from me. He hadn't even told me that his mother was Ukrainian and I, I'd, never, I'd never really thought about it. I just assumed that she was Polish, but she wasn't, she was Ukrainian. And I, you know, there are reasons for that, I think, which would be interesting to discuss, but I won't go into that now. And uh, having uh, produced many new plays over uh, a couple of decades by that time, or three decades, um, uh, I realized that writing a book was a rather difficult thing to do, to, especially as I didn't consider myself to be a writer. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try writing a play instead. That might be a bit easier. That's what I did. The play was very successful. That encouraged me to write the book. Um, and uh, I did that. And uh, then my, my great friend Brian Ross uh, came with us on both our tours to Ukraine in 2010 and 2013, uh, during which time he uh, filmed quite a lot of the stuff that you'll see in Circling a Fox, the uh, documentary. Um, uh, so these are, uh, uh, The Tale of Inverness, which is really the core of it, the play, uh, is a play with two characters, me and my father. Uh, broadly speaking, the first half of it is my father's account of his life, and the second half of it is my discovery of some aspects of the truth in my father's life. And uh, maybe I guess my five minutes is probably about up now. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, there's lots to talk about, I guess, but, um, but uh, it's, it's been a very fundamentally important part of my life. And through it all, I've discovered um, that my small family has suddenly become rather large because I, I've, I discovered new family in both Poland and Ukraine and uh, it's been a really wonderful part of the second half of my life. Thank you for that, Matthew. That's really a wonderful introduction to your work. And of course, we'll keep coming back to the show, so you'll be able to tell us more about the process of making it. Um, but let's let's move to uh, to Michael now. Michael, the the story of the discovery of the letters on which you based your uh, your work is just as interesting as the letters themselves. Could you tell us a little bit about the discovery and also how you came to, to produce the documentary, please? Yeah, sure. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Um, there's actually a little bit of uh, parallels to Matthew's story with the, um, the migration of uh, grandparents and ancestors fleeing uh, the smoldering remains of uh, war-torn Europe. And so my grandparents also came in as refugees and arrived just after the war in 1946. And uh, whilst I was born and raised in London many, many years later, um, I briefly uh, had some time around the grandparents before we left London and moved to Wales. Um, actually, largely the main reason for moving from Wales was because of the two children that my grandparents had. Uh, one 
my father was a relatively stable, well-rounded individual. His his sister um, was was not, and that he really needed to feel that he needed to create some physical separation for his family to be able to be in a in a kind of also a safe environment. Um, for reasons that will become more apparent uh, if we have more time to speak about it, or it's something that we're kind of still working through right now. But um, that would actually become still the precursor for everything else that was to follow, because 20 years later, um, the same sister who uh, my father needed to create some distance from would actually then also herself move from London to Wales. And in the process of moving, um, repeating what my father had did 20 years earlier, would bring all of her hoarded possessions that she had accumulated over a lifetime. And uh, we are talking about um, a, a very, very uh, obsessive compulsion to hoard and accumulate and absorb all manners of artifacts, um, documents, knickknacks, everything, junk, rubbish, it all came with her when she moved in two huge removal lorries and she built garages and sheds in her new location when she came to Wales to be close because that was the only family that she had left. She was, my, my father had married and had four children. She was unmarried and had no children. Um, and we are talking, and uh, when uh, Chocha Zosha, Auntie Sophie, um, moved another 10 years would pass and still i was pretty much oblivious to my own family history uh, i had a few um, introductions to polish culture through work in london when i where i was working i went to visit poland a few times to catch up with relatives and make introductions but i was still pretty much oblivious to anything about what the situation was um, as to how we ended up and what can define the shape of our family tree and following the passing of Chacha Zosha, um, then became uh, a decision. Do we as a family um, go through everything that she'd left behind, of which I was very reluctantly uh, against and fairly vociferous in my objections at that time. My father said, I'm going through it with or without you. And as um, he was on his own and I was in a period of and place in my life where I, I was very flexible with time, I then agreed, okay, well, if he's gonna be stubborn, which is, a, I think, another family trait that we have inherited, um, I'm gonna help him. So we spent a, at least a year before um, a whole um, cache of very uh, interesting and curious artifacts uh, arose and out of that enormous pile. And uh, of that um, interesting artifacts and uprisings contained um, documents, letters, um, old cassettes, old photographs. And uh, I think then at that point, something inside me just clicked to say, I, I have to, like a kind of a photo fit, um, I have to fit it together and find out what these pieces of the puzzle represented. And it would go on to, as, as far as with respect to our family history story, it would be a, a genealogical puzzle from which started then um, a family history recovery project to get in touch with the family from who uh, were it contained within the photos and the documents, make some initial visits and reach out to even the new family that I had never, I'd only maybe heard of in passing, but never met. We all then finally managed to get everyone to um, communicate and we'd get some some more information and then from the family history project that uh, resulted in these collection of letters from great grandmother Yusefa who was actually then kept in Chacha Zosha's um, possessions uh, for, for all those years uh, became the subject initially for one um, University Department of International Relations in Vilnius to ask would the story of the recovery of these letters be of interest to share in, uh, in a historical exhibition and that then allowed and kind of became the the initial event for the further uh, historical exhibitions and opportunities for the story of the discovery of the letters that were written by an ancestor who was um, repressed for being uh, 
what's defined as the mother of, of, of a traitor and um, she was exiled to Kazakhstan and she wrote a collection of letters to her daughters and of uh, her youngest daughter is the grandmother that I had a, the barest memories of as, 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 a, as a child in London and that grandmother's daughter, Zosha, who there was a lot of family tension growing up in the family that we were always mindful of and we were always told that we had to be careful of, in fact, um, was, had, had this uh, cache of letters and another chunk to the family history that was there. And somehow we're still ourselves resolving the kind of paradox that has, ar has arisen from that. But um, the, the final story of how then the letters moved its way around to be able to get back with me as someone that felt it as a personal journey to try then to really get to a, a level of truth and fact finding about what were the conditions that these letters were written and who wrote them. So more about the author of the letters and those conditions as to why they were ever written. Yeah, that was a personal journey for me that took me back to what I would at the time was thinking was the, the source which was Moscow and um, to get back to the uh, to speak with institutes and facilities and um, museums and would eventually get to the Gulag History Museum, make some dis further discoveries there, would, have, would also then manage to get to Kazakhstan to where Yusef was exiled and where she remains buried in the steppe and also locate the uh, various uh, loc locations and, and further archive documents there. And in a way, we've kind of come full circle now with the historical and we are myself looking to um, use what was created in terms of creative, uh, creative content and expressions that, that managed to allow for the film, the documentary film to be created. Um, and now the next project would be a book to try and finally tie it all together. So in, eventually we will hopefully um, have something, yeah. Let's wonderful for that yeah Such excellent uh, uh, projects come out of this bundle of letters that could have been so easily lost in your documentary i think you have a photograph of the of the room the storage room full of bags um this is it you found those letters it's absolutely fascinating so it's really good that your father was stubborn uh, to go through them <laughs> and that you, that you this is it. And, and and also that uh, chocho was stubborn to to hoard them Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes. You never know what could be found in, in the storage room, for sure, mm -hmm. or in an attic somewhere. Uh, thank you, Michael. We'll come back to those letters. I have more questions about them. But Denis and Anastasia, I'd like to ask you about your book a little bit, just to kind of describe it to us. But also, why write a family memoir now? Why write it together? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just start and just say that the book was... Um, I mean, I started writing the book, uh, believe it or not, in... Everest base camp. So in um, when I was a lot fitter, I used to climb mountains and one of the mountains I wanted to climb was Everest. And so uh, when you when you do it, you have a lot of time because you wait for the weather window. Uh, and so you really have nothing better to do. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to write something about the family, but also about the history of that part of Ukraine, which is uh, relatively unexplored in the West and to look at that history through the eyes of our ancestors and uh, really the interesting thing is that anastasia in some ways is like your auntie yusef your, your auntie um gosha. Gosha. Uh, gosha there you go because she was actually born here in the uk and she was the first person in our family as far as i could say uh, to have been born in the uk for maybe a thousand years and that was an interesting idea well why would she end up being born in, in London, as opposed to Lviv or Peremeshel, which is where most of the family is coming from. And really the two key characters in the book are um, two, uh, my grandma and my wife's grandma, and both of them are Anastasia's great grandmas, who fought for the Ukrainian independence army called UPA, and uh, were captured, one of them was captured by the Russians and sent to the, to the Gulag, and the other one was captured by the Germans and was sent to a concentration camp in Germany. <laughs> and uh, it was quite an interesting sort of idea of um, people who were fighting for the same cause being captured by two of the greatest tyrannies in, uh, in the, of the 20th century and, um, and punished by, uh, by them. And in fact, uh, the, the uh, grandma who was 
in the German camp, uh, you know, her interview is in the book and she was still alive when we was, were writing it. And she was born in 1918 in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, believe it or not, just before it collapsed. <laughs> so she lived uh, in Peremyshel and, and its surroundings uh, all her life, all her very long life. And country borders were changing multiple times over that time. She, she must have lived in at least uh, six or seven different states in that time. Having, having never moved really, except for the for the uh, for the concentration camp. Anyway, so that's the book. Um, I'll just show you a few slides about Galicia and why why about Galicia in particular, and then Anastasia will say a little about her experiences too. So let me just uh, show you a couple of slides, <clears throat> uh, and um, so that's the book. The book you can see the. Uh, it's actually Anastasia and her great great grandma, who and the you know you can see that the picture on the left is was taken about a hundred years before uh, Anastasia's picture was taken. They look remarkably similar. They're almost like the same face. It's really quite extraordinary. You can juxtapose them in this way. Anyway, so just for people who are not that familiar with Galicia, I think one of the one of the key maps to provide you the understanding of what it is, is this map here, which is somewhat uh, maybe surprising. It's the map of the Eurasian steppe. Basically, if you live in China or Mongolia or a place like that, and if you sit on a horse and you want to go somewhere, the only place you could go is west along this Eurasian steppe. Otherwise, you hit either really high mountains or forests or uh, other obstacles. And where you end up is Galicia, is Halicina. This is exactly where it actually ends. So some people occasionally would move over the Carpathian Mountains into something else, into Europe, but a lot of people you know, are funneled into this place. And um, over many, many hundreds and maybe thousands of years. Uh, and so what you have in, in Galicia is really quite a unique uh, blend of humanity. The second picture, which I think uh, might be of, of interest, is the religious um, affiliations of Ukrainians. And you can see that the vast majority of Ukrainians are Orthodox, except for Galicia. So you can see the three oblasts, the three regions in the West. This is Galicia. This is Lviv, Ternopil, and uh, ivano frankivsk And the majority of people there are uh, Greek Catholic, which is the type of a Catholic religion <clears throat> different from um, the rest of Ukraine. And also Galicia is different politically as well. So right from the first presidential elections in 1991, Galicians voted differently, usually from the rest of Ukraine. So in 91, the majority of Galicians voted for a person called Vyacheslav Chornovil. Uh, for, those, for those of you who have never seen him or, or have heard him speak, he was like Václav Havel from Czechia, but with a lot more charisma. It's <laughs> really quite an extraordinary guy. Spent years and years in prison and um, uh, was a, uh, a realistic candidate to become the president of Ukraine in 91. And you know, and over the, the years of independence, Ukraine, Galicians voted somewhat differently. And you can see in the last, in, in 2019, when the majority of Ukraine voted for Zelensky, who's the current president, Galicians, of course, had to vote differently. And uh, the majority of Galicians voted for uh, Petro Poroshenko, who was the president before. So there are real differences that still exist that make uh, Galicia unique. Uh, but I have to say, you know, there are things that make uh, Galicians really very similar to Ukrainians too. And it's hard to imagine a Galician or somebody from Donetsk or Krim, Crimea who would say no to this delicious bowl of Varaniki with uh, Vishnu, which is like a sour cherry. Anyway, with that, I'll hand over to Anastasia. Hello, um, I'm Anastasia. Um, Dennis is also, um, I'd also like to show some slides, if that's okay. Um, can you see this? Um, yeah, so, um, I, um, when I was younger, um, you know, I'd go to spend my summers in Ukraine and stuff, and I saw my family as 
like my family they didn't really think of them as like having these like historical stories behind them and stuff and as historical figures and then I think as I started doing more history at school and learning about um well more so Russia but the Cold War and um you know how like the Soviet Union and stuff it kind of piqued my interest a bit more and I kind of started talking to them more about um their stories and finding out more and I got really interested in that um, and I showed my, so this is much to my friends um, around Ukraine. Um, I try and make it a point to take as many of my friends as I can. And they always end up really liking it and being very surprised. I think none of them, well, most of them don't really know what Ukraine is or, um, you know, before they met me, thought it was a part of Russia or something. And I think a lot of them kind of have this picture in their heads of this like grey communist, um, like not very nice country. And then they go here and they see these beautiful buildings and, you know, the Austrian architecture. And I think, they're so surprised by the people that are so welcoming and everything's so cheap and it really changes their minds. Um, that's some of the pictures. <laughs> and then, um, so I did this art project where I took these pictures um, of me and friends in Ukraine and I had a look at my parents' pictures, um, which you can see here. And, um, you know, me and my friends went to the same place that they went to and, uh, you know, it was this weird, like, kind of intergenerational thing that started going on and I just found it so weird that we, you know, because of travel and because, it was a more of an open country we were able to visit these places and um you know kind of be in those same footsteps as my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents to an extent um and I kind of started thinking about how all of our adolescences must have been so different um that you know even though it was on the same ground well not, not really me but the same ground that they all grew up on how much that country had changed over the years um and I just kind of blended them together in a few photos here but um yeah, it's just such an interesting, interesting place. And I'm so like lucky to be able to share it with my friends and then to share it through a book as well. Um, and I'd like to add on to my dad's point that anyone in Ukraine enjoys a plate of Varenica and extend that to anyone in Ukraine and England enjoys a plate of Varenica because my friends have never said no to a plate either. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wonderful. We'll come back to this sort of intergenerational interplay that you have in the, in the book. It's really curious. I'll, I've got a couple of questions to ask about that, but thanks for that introduction. Um, so I, before I, I ask the next round of questions, I, I'd like to um, encourage all of our attendees to post their questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll collect them and we will then be able to uh, voice hopefully all of them or at least some of them in the last half an hour or so. So please don't be shy, post them as we speak um, but but I have I have another a set of questions before we move on to an open discussion. Mafia I'll come back to you um, and the tailor of Inverness. Um, I'd really like to talk a bit more about this process of turning a personal story into uh, a publicly performed theater piece. Um, it's not unfamiliar uh, to me and it's something that, that I tried to do before as Maria mentioned I uh, wrote and staged um, a theatre piece um, based on my own family story, much more recent than, than, than that of your father's. So it's connected to the war in Donbass, the ongoing war. It's the story of my brother. Um, and the main difficulty I had was making my personal story universal enough for others to care. I mean, I really kept asking myself, well, why should people be interested? Obviously, I am, my family is, but why should others be? And the other difficulty was making yourself quite so vulnerable. As an actor, you are vulnerable. You use that vulnerability and channel it to, you know, to, to make a successful piece. But here you, you open yourself up so much on stage. So tell us a bit more about the writing, the staging and performing. Um, and this sort of, you know, um, slipping in and out of your, of your father's story, really, because you become your father on stage uh, for quite a significant chunk of the piece. And then, and you tell his story, and uh, often, as far as I understood verbatim, based on the interviews that you collected, but then you also slip out of that role and, and tell your own story. And I found the the two and how they merged absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, to be honest, you know, I was 49 years old when the Taylor of Inverness opened. And uh, it, I dare say that uh, that play could have been written and produced a long time before then, but um, uh, there was a, you know, a great deal of hesitancy on my part to actually make the story public because, because it's so personal and because it also exposes some very difficult um, facts which my father kept secret. Uh, until he died, and, and my mother did uh, subsequently, of course. Uh, um, so, 
you know, there, there was a kind of reluctance on my part to expose my mother, um, who was alive when the, when the play opened and only actually died four years ago. Um, uh, so that was another reason why I hesitated and then why, why it, it didn't uh, manifest itself until 2008. Um, but, you know, the more that I looked into my father's story, um, the more I realised that uh, um, and understood, you know, having read a lot, you know, I've been aware of quite a lot of the history of the Second World War since I, you know, I went to Auschwitz when I was 12, you know, and uh, so, you know, I, I kind of, I, you know, I, I knew that there's this massive weight of history, which was, had, you know, affected that part of the world in particular, so heavily. Um, and, you know, which I, I still think in many ways, it's, it's, it's still coming to terms with. And, um, uh, and, and the more I looked into my father's story and, especially when I discovered the contradictions and the deceptions and the lies that, um, that actually, you know, what I had was a story about what war does to ordinary people and families, wherever they happened. You know, these things are going on right now, you know, in Gaza, in Syria, in Congo, uh, in Yemen. Um, you know, the kind of story that the Taylor of Inverness is, is occurring as we speak in Donbass. You know, and uh, um, so, and and it's so. Uh, you know, I've I've been fortunate. You know, I I, I trained in the way that I trained, and and have worked and immersed my life in the theatre for such a for my whole uh, adult life. And uh, so, you know, and I'm not I'm not a crap actor. I'm quite good at acting. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I can use that ability to communicate this very complex history which you know the great majority of people in this country know nothing about one of the things I think it, one of the reasons that Brexit happened and one of the things that I think people in this country really cannot grasp um, is is occupation because this country has not been occupied by an invading army since 1066 unless you live in the highlands of Scotland of course in which case the British government army occupied the highlands of Scotland after 1746 um, uh, well in fact before then even uh, but uh, so, um, so uh, I, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question sufficiently, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. No, absolutely. And I think in the documentary, you say that you felt that your father, so while your father didn't tell you the whole story or told you the story that differed from what you discovered later uh, when he was still alive, he left you a gift that you could then turn into. Absolutely. I mean, all these deceptions, yeah, actually make make the the whole story more interesting, you know, because you have all these contradictions and all these questions about, well, why did he uh, conceal all this? You know, what was he ashamed of? You know, and uh, um, uh, and it's yeah, and it's uh, and it provides a kind of you know when you know I decided that it was best just to present this play um, myself, you know. With a, there's a violinist on stage, and the violin is a kind of character, if you like, that's very important in the in the whole uh, um, show. And the violinist, the actual figure of the violinist, who doesn't really move except you know he's he's in his seat and uh, upstage uh, 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 left. Um, you know he he's he's dressed in a costume which sort of blends in with the backdrop, and the backdrop is is made of clothing. And obviously, you know, that's that's an echo of the fact that the, uh, the, the set is a bit like a kind of uh, tailor's workshop. But the clothing, it's the clothing of, you know, children, women, men, and, you know, the violinist and what the violinist plays, what the violinist wears, blending in with the backdrop, is meant to evoke the dead, you know, the dead of this history, you know, which is legion, of course. So... Um, uh, but I, I felt that uh, it was best to. Uh, but the, there's there's a drama that occurs in this kind of tension between me and my father uh, through all these discoveries I made. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, I began, uh, while I've got you, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you another, another question quickly. I began by introducing you and I on purpose said your name in three different ways. You, and you have different languages in your show. So you, it's mostly in, in, in English, <laughs> um, Scottish, and uh, it's in your father's uh, English and Scottish as well. And then it's also in bits of it are in Polish, some of the songs, there's some German, there's some Ukrainian. Have I missed something? There's a little bit of Russian. A little bit of Russian, that's right. A really bad pronunciation. <laughs> Tell us a bit about how, how you made those choices of, of including those languages. I thought they worked beautifully. And I think, I mean, maybe maybe I say that because I could understand all of those. But even if you didn't have the subtitles for them, I think they would still add to that atmosphere of Galicia that uh, Denise described. That sure. completely multicultural place that, that yeah. suffers so badly. Um, and, and loses such such multicultural identity because of the Second World War and the violence that, that came with it. But, but just tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I thought it was important to evoke that multicultural nature of, of Galician society before uh, the Second World War, um, you know, which was, uh, you know, Jewish, Ukrainian, Polish, and, and there were also a, a small number of ethnic Germans living there too. And uh, um, uh, but also, you know, it's a reflection of my father's journey, you know, and uh, both the journey he told me which he took, which wasn't true, and the journey he took, which was true, you know, and it involved uh, Ukraine and Russia and, and uh, um, Germany and, uh, and Italy, actually, although there's no Italian in the, in the show, um, and of course, uh, ultimately the UK. Um, so, and I felt it was important to kind of uh, respect those cultures as much as I could possibly uh, do through the music and the uh, and the language, um, and to give give some sense of that that place where he grew up, which was a, a classic Galician village, you know, um, a mixture of Poles and Ukrainians. Apparently, only one Jewish family in that in that particular village. Um, my grandmother was from a village called Mozalivka, which was three kilometers away, which was mainly Ukrainian with some Poles. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah. That it was it was simply really to 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 try and express that kind of um, multi ethnic nature of the place. And of course, you brought the show to the old country and showed it in Lviv, but also brought it almost to, to the village, to to the town next next to the village. How was it received? How did people respond? Because it's not an easy story to to uh, take in. Well, um, well, I mean, it was received very well. I mean, you know, we um, it, we we toured it. In, we toured it in various parts of Ukraine, we, um, and uh, to be honest, the, the reception has just been um, overwhelmingly uh, positive and warm, and um, sort of delighted. And uh, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think um, uh, a foreign theatre company had ever visited Podhaitsky or one or two of the other places we played in Ukraine. Um, and uh, the sort of level of appreciation of just being there was extraordinary. I think one of the, one of the was a very interesting. Uh, sorry to move on from the performance in Pitaitsi, but uh, just one little anecdote it was was very interesting when we played in the in the sort of concert hall in Lutsk, and um, uh, and that was sponsored by the university there, the Volynia University, and um, it was absolutely packed, four hundred people, and uh, quite a restless audience. Um, for the first sort of 10 minutes or so. But as soon as I mentioned the Soviets, silence reigned for the rest of it. I thought, oh my God, what's happened here? You know, do they hate it? You know, are they all pro-Russian here? They're they really not going to like it. I mean, it's not an anti-Russian play, but you know, the Russians don't get a particularly good press in the play. Um, so, uh, but, but you know, I, I, th I, I think it was quite rare at that point, maybe, um, for people to talk so openly about the conflict between the Ukrainians and the Poles, and uh, and and to be so kind of openly um, critical of the Soviets. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, wonderful. You can do another documentary, probably just talking about the reception your play in <laughs> <laughs> Ukraine. Although some of that is in, in the BBC documentary, I really urge everybody to watch it. Um, Matthew, I'll come back to you, and I'm sure our audience will will have lots of questions as well for you. Michael, um, a question to you. Back to your letters. Um, 
they, they, the, the entire project is based around them and they are so moving and so full of pain. Um, you, the bits that you, you, you recite and that the actors recite, um, that comes across really, really clearly. I remember once working in the SBU in the Ukrainian Secret uh, Services um, Archive in Kyiv, and I came across this letter from a mother to a daughter, um, which was uh, sort of similar in, in, in the sense that it was also written just on one piece of paper, which then served as an envelope too. So, it was, you know, every scrap of that paper was used um, very efficiently, um, like one of the letters that you talk about, Yosefa's letters. And I, I had not come across that particular character before. I didn't know her story. All I had was just that letter. And it moved me so much. It made such an impression on me that I still, years later, remember it. And I think I might remember it uh, forever. Um, it, it just has such, such power, that sort of document. Um, but in spite of the emotional charge that, that letters, uh, documents such as letters have, they also can leave more gaps than they fill. I think, um, and yet you, and, and that's probably the case mm -hmm. with Yosefa's letters too, and yet you chose to um, center your entire project on the letters that raise many, many questions, but maybe don't answer as many. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, Alessia, that's um, exactly right about discovering the gaps, not only left in the personal family history, but also more than as you, as I received in my situation, an education in official histories and, and histories of nations, you also discover that the gaps that are then present there as well. And they are reflective of both the struggles to find the truth. Um, and from the personal story for the family to know, the biggest remaining question is why was Yosefa, as an old woman of 76, um, with uh, at that time of her life, uh, recently widowed with, with five children, why was she exiled alone and none of her other children were exiled from that during that period of the, the NKVD operations that were just uh, depolonizing and or anything that was considered a hostile element from that entire borderlands region, emptying that region out in, in this forced population transfer um, pogrom and effectively um we had to you know i'm we're still it's still out there to it's to decide why was Yosefa still taken alone um and clearly these are the remaining gaps w was she a, a, an old woman that was very stubborn it does run in the family and she refused to leave when she was told the red army are coming um did she not believe that as an old woman anything would happen to her because she's she's old and and uh, not not a threat to anybody did she sacrifice herself for her children knowing that she wanted to let the next generation who themselves were all young mothers live or did her children have to sacrifice her as well and these were these are going to be all questions that will never really know still even though so much has been done to try to uncover but if we're going to try to look at some intertextual evidence that are generated by the content of the letters and we start to try to create the psychological profile of this author and to dig and look a bit deeper at the language being used and then you get to see that this collection of, of 22 letters that were written in this period of the one year between 1940 and 1941. So the deportation was the April wave of deportations from Baranovici to Kazakhstan, Aktubinsk. And those letters then were coming at over on an average of about two a month um, before the postal system ceased to operate following the, 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 the Nazi invasion of this region. Um, in that collection of letters, uh, there is a variety of tones and different voices. She's writing to different daughters with different voices, with different degrees of respect, different degrees of disrespect. She's absolutely saying the most beautiful, heartwarming and tender words to one daughter, whilst absolutely cursing another daughter in a different letter. Um, and you, you could also think that then maybe that nothing was coming back. Um, but 
we do see from the letters that she is writing and addressing a daughter, thank you so much for your last letter, which I did receive and some and something. And this was all part of trying to understand the concept that these this this act of letter writing that they were lifelines letters were lifelines for those that were exiled and whilst Josepha was not in a penal gulag she was a special settler given um and sent to under the the the, the, the classic soviet lexicon of the day um improving the living conditions of the ussr in in the great big prison of kazakhstan at that time um she she had this if you call it then again, the good fortune that none of her letters were censored. And even though she was addressing her letters in Russian, in Latin, uh, spelt Russian, not using, um, uh, sorry, she, yeah, she, she was using, she was addressing in Russian, but writing in, in, in her dialect that she wrote all the letters. So again, none of them were censored. They all got out and they were received. And so that's, um, and each, each letter is effectively, they are her last words and thoughts, and they are her factual uh, last posts. There is nothing that can be faked about it or, um, un, uh, uh, you know, again, looking at them as pieces of content that are coming out. I know that th there also have been discussions about how letters from, te especially testimonies can sometimes be have to be very carefully considered and interpreted to, to, to understand whether they give a true account of the conditions from under which they were written. But um, clearly the, the, the overall tone is that this is a mother that's been torn away from her children, forcibly torn away. Uh, clearly she'd spent her whole life um, raising the family um, and was expecting to enjoy the twilight of her life with her with her children and grandchildren. Clearly, the, the war is a, is a hugely uh, chaotic um, event, just put all those plans away. Um, and so uh, the letters really communicate this absolute anguish. So they are a, a desperate account of um, the, the mother separated from her children, as well as a searing indictment of, of the totalitarian regime that created th these these events and yet they would then um, be the uh, impulses that would become the reason why Josefa's youngest daughter my grandmother would no longer wish to return to the Soviet Union after the war which would be her homeland and uh, take the refugees wager which would be to rather than believe that she would die or be repressed if she stayed she would risk death moving to a safer zone and that was the the gamble that she took and paid off wow fascinating thank you michael the the te personal testimonies of course don't tell the whole story and only tell parts of it and we can never expect them to um you know to tell the truth that we're so uh, desperate to find out often as as you know people researching our family stories but also also as historians we're guilty of that as well but what they do tell is precisely what you describe and, and in, in your case in the case of your great-grandmother it's also one of the rare voices of women because there's so few in historical record and to find such letters i mean the, that that's a wonderful record of, of of a woman who went through gulag and was able to leave uh, something behind um, which often doesn't happen um we can already see parallels the language i think um you know that i discussed with matthew earlier is important here too the 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 address is written in russian and in cyrillic the the letters themselves are written using latin alphabet and what you describe as borderland um dialect which is interesting you don't even ascribe a language to it um, would, would that be a Polish um, that she wrote in? Yeah, I mean, having, having had it reviewed by a professional philologist um, that uh, also then shared it with other philologist uh, colleagues, that was generally the phrase that was given an obscure borderlands dialect that reflected the geographic and temporal locations of the time. Um, it mixed Staropolsky with either you could call Russian words or Belarusian words. Josefa was married to an Orthodox Belarusian. She herself was a uh, Catholic from a Catholic um, Polish speaking family that occupied that, that region. And 
but grammatically, it's most most similar to Old Polish, and after the philological process, it needed to be translated into modern Polish for smoother reading of the letters. Um, but it could be seen that there were many uh, orthographic omissions by Josefa. She didn't include certain dots over certain letters that are now consistent with modern Polish. Um, that there were um, also conjugations and other uh, anomalies that the philologists were scratching their heads over. And again, not sure as to whether this was largely done because of duress, that she was under duress writing. Um, but in certain letters, you can see that there is um, handwriting discrepancies. Uh, there's also letters are rushed. Other letters are very meditated and uh, very focused. There's also just folds in the paper and smudges as well. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, and the mix of um, the mix of languages and the the, the 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 kind of complication of even figuring out what language it is exactly is, I think, very telling of the region itself and what we've been discussing. Yeah, so the philologist has kind of asterisked those words from the complete collection, which uh, I'm happy to share and make available as a document. It's just a word document that contains the letters, and you can see the the other words that are have been translated. Um, in, in, in the footnotes. Wonderful. Denise, uh, I'm going to ask you um, a question that's more related to your professional work uh, than, than the book. Um, when we talk about these family narratives, especially if we're talking about narratives coming from the region and the period so filled with violence uh, as, as Ukraine, Poland and Belarus witnessed and suffered in the 20th century, are we dealing with the case of transgenerational trauma? What, what is it? Tell us what this is if it exists and whether uncovering these family stories is therapeutic or perhaps the opposite it's a wonderful question Alyssa. thank you for this and i have to say i'm so uh, glad that one of my wonderful colleagues helen minnis who is from glasgow matthew believe it or not uh, is listening to this and uh, if i don't know helen if you um could say something in the comments i would be really curious to know what you think about that i'll say what i what I think, but she's actually a real specialist in this field, um, especially when it comes to um, early trauma in children. That's that, that's her main sort of um, work. She's the only professor of child psychiatry in, in Scotland as well. Um, interestingly, anyhow. So going back to your question, um, there is no doubt that children of parents who underwent significant trauma will themselves have significantly more psychiatric disorders. There's no doubt about that. And the first, the systematic study of that was uh, on um, children of the Holocaust survivors. So that's, uh, they had significantly uh, greater risk of psychiatric disorders. But that is not limited to people who underwent something as horrendous as the, as the Holocaust. Uh, the more we understand about trauma, the more important it seems in our field. There are really very interesting studies now, for example, looking at survivors of the so-called Dutch famine in the, you know, towards the end of the war, when you, if you look at offspring of people who were pregnant at the time, they, for example, also have a very different profile, even metabolic profile. And, um, but that now we understand goes towards so many different insults, both intrauterine, so when there's a fetus inside a woman's uh, body, and also in terms of um, early experiences of children, that you know, the, the, at, at the extreme, one could say that a lot of um, problems that we face in modern society could be explained by various types of uh, traumas and, and insults that children have um, had during their intrauterine growth and also in generations before. I just maybe wanted to say a little bit, I don't want to go into epigenetics as a field because it's going to take a very long time to get significantly bored by this idea. But uh, I just wanted to mention something that we now understand the mechanisms of this a lot, a lot more. And I will say towards the end something that Olesya will and Anastasia will like as uh, people who, who do history. <laughs> Essentially, what it is is that 
we all have genes that for many years we thought were determining what we are going to be like. But recently we now begin, begin to understand that that is not true, that the genes themselves are probably, well, are definitely not the entire answer and probably not even the majority of the answer. What is important is what actually happens to these genes during the development of the child, but also, interestingly, during the previous generations as well. There is something called the epigenetic changes to this material. Uh, th there are different mechanisms. One of them is called the methylation, which switches on and off different genes that then themselves become inherited. And now we understand more and more and more that in order to understand our susceptibility to different disorders, we probably should look at history. So history becomes not just something that forms your identity or you know, makes you understand where, you know, where you're coming from and your surroundings, but also might have a real interesting role in understanding public health. So that's what I wanted to say about that. That's absolutely fascinating. You should think about yourself less as a public uh, health professional now. I'll put that <laughs> on my CV for sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But that's absolutely fascinating. And actually, I didn't realize that we had one of the questions in the Q&A already um, specifically raising this, this issue. So I'll um, um, add to what, we, what we've just raised there. Um, it, it raises the question that, you know, the, the, um, and Andrew Savchenko says that uh, he, he's struck by the fact by, by the similarities between the themes that you've raised uh, the speakers today and um, the survivors and children of Holocaust survivors. And his question really is, are there any unique features to the experiences of the UK-based Ukrainian second generation? Is there anything about Ukrainians that's different from, from, from others from, from that region or elsewhere who, 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 um, you know, who had to undergo very similar traumas, would you say? Well, I mean, I can only, there are obviously no systematic studies of that kind, which it would be a fascinating, it would be somebody's PhD, right? So let's say if somebody wanted to look at that. But, um, but. Uh, Perhaps I mean, we could co-supervise it. You, you could see. <laughs> there you go, what a good idea. Look, uh, mental health and history playing together. Uh, it, it'd be a fascinating, I, actually, I really think that um, because- Sign me up, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because but I can tell you why. Because because also because um, Ukrainians here come from so many different backgrounds as well, and you will have some who will have experience of the famine of the Great Famine, which Anastasia writes so much about in our book about you know, and you know that is something that is uh, really, I mean the the famine in in Holland was tiny, was a smidgen in comparison to what happened in Ukraine, and yet we have a lot more genetic studies and uh, uh, public health studies of that relatively small cohort, as opposed to millions of other Ukrainians you know, who were affected by this, and some of them who live in the UK. And at the same time, you also have um, uh, people from the territory of current Ukraine who are Jewish, you know, and who underwent horrendous uh, experiences in Ukraine, both the Tsarist, the east of Ukraine, and also in the west of Ukraine, in Galicia who carry that uh, experience with them. Then obviously you have Poles, you have the Polish people who really were affected like very few other countries during the Second World War and uh, who, uh, Matthew may, may correct me, but who often think that Poland was betrayed many times, you know, in, by, by other countries, uh, at least three times. <laughs> Uh, in in thirty nine during the Warsaw uprising and then after after the war you know so that's that's a different trauma altogether and then many of them from the Krasse from the east feel that you know their their country was taken over by some strange state that never existed in Ukraine you know, so I, I think looking at these different types of traumas uh, would be a fascinating experience and uh, uh, you know could could also shed some light into some of the challenges that we have uh, in healthcare today. Wow, and, and um, um, Andrew Savchenko also in the Q&A um, uh, clarified part of his question that perhaps I didn't uh, immediately understand that, you know, on, in addition to all of these experiences, Ukrainians were also um, a stateless nation for quite a long time and, and were not necessarily 
seen as you know as Ukrainian, so that might have affected their perception. If I understand it correctly, we will hopefully have time uh, to invite Andrew to to ask his question uh, live. But before we move on to um, to Q and A with the rest of our attendees, I'd like to ask Anastasia just to tell us a little bit about what the process of writing this book um, together with your father. Um, well, it was like for you, um, has it affected your self-perception, your identity? Uh, was there a point when you maybe wanted to say, I've had enough of these Ukrainians, I just want to be a, a, a British young woman and forget about all this trauma? <laughs> um, I think as a family, my family's very nationalistic, so I don't think I've ever really questioned <laughs> if I'm Ukrainian or not. <laughs> I don't think I'm never allowed to question that really. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, writing the book definitely changed my perspective on a lot of things. I think, you know, it draws to light. I know Ukraine had gone through a lot of stuff as a country, but it kind of, when you put it all together like that, you kind of realise really how much it has gone through. Um, and, you know, like how people have suffered from that. But I think it has made Ukraine stronger as a country in a way, because there is this kind of trauma that people have been able to deal with together. And this common enemy that's kind of, kind of brought them together as a nation which I think is really interesting to, you know, write about and stuff. And, you know, spending a lot of hours with my dad just at a screen, um, just like, you know, uh, like learning so many things about my family and things that he knew and I knew and things that neither of us knew that we just uncovered together. There was also a lot of grammatical uh, <laughs> incompetencies, I might say, that it took us quite a while to go through, such as um, the soft remixes, I want to say, that and up. Um, and again, we've got that journey together. I think uh, he's a lot better at using those now. So yeah, that's what he's good. My genes, you see, uh, to just <laughs> the, 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 the articles, sadly. Absolutely. Yeah, just, I kind of started seeing my family in a different light. And instead of just, you know, granny and granddad, it was like granny and granddad with these big, big stories behind them who made them who they were. Excellent. Wonderful. Great. Okay, let's open the floor. Um, there are lots and lots of wonderful questions. Let's begin with Natalia. Zayat, or perhaps Zions, and perhaps we'll discover another <laughs> distant relative. Who knows? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much hello. to all of the speakers and all of the organizers um, for this very rich discussion, for this very moving discussion. Um, my question is about um, the research and the creative process. Um, so I'm a social historian. I also do creative writing sometimes. And one of the most challenging things I find between code switching between these two genres is um, sometimes getting lost in the forest and uh, not seeing kind of the, the wood for the trees. Um, and so I wondered if it'd be possible to comment uh, for all of the speakers briefly on this process of combining historical research and creative work uh, as you dug deeper. So whether it's, you know, um, reading about the economic conditions in the Gulag or, you know, statistics of how many people went there or uh, the details of, uh, of the Second World War. As you get into archival research to create a wider context for your family stories, um, I'm curious how you were able to still ground your stories in the personal, in the textures of a sight, smell, sound, all of these things that make creative writing uh, really lively. Um, or did you have moments when you really struggled when you found that it was difficult to combine these two elements? Thank you very much. Great. Who'd like to start? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that. I mean, I think, you know, uh, I, there, there's no right or wrong answer to that question, uh, Natalia. I think that, you know, there's, it's, it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of alchemy, if you like, you know, it depends. I think I think what's what I'd advise you to do is is to uh, I suppose a few things are important uh, certainly from in my experience is is one have some idea who you're actually writing this for um, uh, and why you're why you're writing it why why is it important I think you've got to ask yourself those kind of questions and um, and uh, and then it's. It's so easy, I think, to go down all sorts of rabbit holes. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I've read quite a lot about all this uh, history and, and, um, and I know that there's masses more that I haven't read and I would love to read it all, but you just can't possibly do it. And I think there's a kind of a sort of physical limitation one, ha one has in terms of time and energy. And, um, and it's just trying to make those judgments about what you think is most important and, 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 and really kind of um, 
uh, sticking to your subject, being quite focused on what your subject is. It was quite easy for me because my subject was my father, you know, and, and that's someone that wasn't, you know, that I was very focused on that. But of course, there's a massive amount of uh, extrapolation one can do. And uh, I, I, I just, uh, you just got to exercise an awful lot of self-discipline. I'm sorry if that's a rather kind of boring and prosaic answer, but um, uh, kind of, you know, just question yourself what it is you want to write and why you want to write it. And I think if you've got those answers, you know, that will help you. I just add a little to this because um, it's a really good question, I think. And the reality, though, is that one could spend the entirety of the book just talking about troubles and trauma and the horrendous experiences. But the reality is, you know, the life is much richer than that. And when you look at all of these events, and I'm sure that Matthew and uh, Michael have found something similar, you know, you find funny things and dramatic things, love, you know, that, my, uh, my my grandma was traveling via Vienna during the war, and my granddad uh, met her at, uh, at the railway station and said, you either go and follow your dream to Zagreb to do your arts uh, scholarship, or you stay in Vienna and marry, marry me. You know, the, uh, these kinds of e events that occur, you know, or, uh, and, and, and then you, you sort of realize that life is so much richer and so much more dramatic than what we find in, in history books. And I think, so who, for those of you who think about writing history through the eyes of your, of, your, um, of your ancestors, I think there's nothing better than that. It just gives you this amazingly rich perspective on these events that you would never find in an ordinary history book, I think. Excellent. And um, we have a question from uh, Lesa Scully that sort of follows follows on from this. I'll, I'll read it out. She's asked me to read it out. What piece of advice would you give to those embarking on writing a family history? I suspect that uh, quite a few of our attendees might consider doing that. What pitfalls to avoid over planning or running without a plan? And what suggestions for successful project completion? Um, if you uh, allow me to abuse my role of moderator, I would suggest get in touch with historians who work on the subject. We like to be useful now and again. Um, we can always try and help. Um, but what, what is your advice? Well, I'd, I'd just like to um, let that question questioner know that there's so much help now on the social media as one very positive way of being able to connect with so many groups who are all uh, searching and posing questions on the same topic for a particular ethnic branch uh, or identity that you're interested in. So if you're coming from a mosaic of nations, either from your, through your heritage, through your grandparents, you can find a group on social media that are interested in everything to do with the genealogy of that history. And it's a great start to become part of those groups, to be able to um, share any documents you have or to, if you're just beginning to start to understand the history like I was when I really came from an ab initio position to really educate myself, then I had to use a lot of what I found through those groups to um, find stories that resonated that I could say I, you'd, you'd meet other people whose grandparents were sent to that particular displaced person's camp when they were refugees who came to um, a country like the UK, or the or if they were repressed, if they went to another particular camp. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people who are out there on social media in these groups, and that's a great way to start. And if it's about actually writing the book, then it, it's it's also one of the biggest challenges is to find that structure, that narrative structure that you want to try and settle on that's going to be compelling. And I think that also raises part of what Alessia first introduced this topic of how to find that universal message and how to, what's going to be that universalizing message if you're going to try and share it with others to make them also interested in your story. But if you're doing it for your own personal family history, then um, you can be a lot more specific and you, you know you're just sharing it with family. Um, so yeah, find that finding that narrative is, is also where you can get some help from social media as well, from groups. Excellent. Any other tips? I would say that um, communicating, if it is family life still, that you um, are writing about, I think communicating with them about what you are writing about is quite crucial because we've run into some blips after the book was published 
um, with some family members that weren't all happy or telling about what was said about them. Equally, if you want to give a true, you know, from your own perspective, if you that's what you're gonna portray, then maybe you know you don't want to get any bias involved by speaking to them. But if it, I don't know, it, <laughs> it could save it could save some trouble to have a lot of communication and ask them and tell them what's written about them before it's published. Very sound advice indeed. Matthew, anything from you? Well, that makes me want to read your book even more, Dennis and Anastasia. Um, <laughs> should be on the back cover. We said some things that our family members didn't like. <laughs> don't don't yeah. tell my dad about this, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, you know, I think I think another interesting thing to think about is what you don't find out, or what you can't find out, or what or what is kept from you. You know, um, because those things actually, you know, were fundamentally. Uh, important to certainly what I have produced and um, and and the fact that you know I, I think what one of the one of the reasons I think why there are so many people from that part of the world who are uh, like me and who are attending tonight you know wanting to know more about their family history is because so much was suppressed and uh, um, you know the first time I went to Ukraine in 2003 and uh, uh, I was I was around the village by my dad's cousin he spoke ukrainian and i spoke english neither of us spoke our own uh, each other's language and he just walked me around the town and took me to the ukrainian cemetery the huge jewish cemetery the huge ruined jewish synagogue the the huge ruined polish catholic church and he just showed me these places and buildings and um and you know that was a that was a great history lesson you know um so uh yeah, I think I think you know the kind of feelings that are evoked are sometimes as important as, as the as the facts you might learn or research. Absolutely. On the on the question of um, untold stories, we have um, one one of the questions that we received from uh, one of the attendees. I don't have their name sadly um, to share with you, but it's that it's for you, Matthew. And it says you highlighted the fact that your father did not tell you that your grandmother was Ukrainian. Why do you think that was? Uh, well, you know, I don't really know because uh, I was never able to confront him uh, about it. But I believe it's to do with the fact that that uh, um, in the years, the decades following immediately following the Second World War, um, the Ukrainians got a very bad press in in the UK. You know, um, they were they didn't get much press at all. But when they did, you know, it was often as you know adver. You know, you got this impression, and I certainly did, uh, that um, you know Auschwitz was uh, was run by Nazis, Germans, um, with Ukrainians as their minions, and that uh, you know the, the brutal Ukrainian prison guards were a kind of you know um, caricature uh, or um, image of Ukrainians, and also I think it's also to do with the fact that there was this very brutal conflict between the Ukrainians and the Poles in Volhynia particularly, but also in Galicia um, uh, uh, in the final years of the war and, and for some time after that. And, um, uh, you know, so so uh, people who had been neighbours, you know, um, were killing each other and, um, and uh, you know, so I think, I think that created a huge kind of barrier between uh, Poles and Ukrainians after the war. Uh, and you know, I it's it's strange to me, you know, that he never told me that his mother was Ukrainian. I, I really don't understand that. But you know, I, I I can only imagine. You know, obviously he went through some real trauma during the war, um, and I think he was a very frightened person actually to to keep these things from me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's Thank that's you. all I can say. Yeah. As it happens, we are actually joined uh, here among the attendees by Vanda Kostya, uh, who made a documentary film about uh, the Volhynia massacre called My Friend, the Enemy, um, which really tells this absolutely uh, brutal, difficult story through human, um, relatable, personal uh, histories. And uh, I would recommend um, um, to all of you who are interested in, in, in that part of history and the region to, to watch that film. Uh, okay, we've got another um, question and it's from Oyam Blacker. Oyam, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, thanks for such uh, an interesting discussion. My question is about um, place and displacement, actually. 
um, and the kind of you know the, there's a very powerful relationship between memory, identity, and place. And it's one one thing that I looked at and looked at a lot in my own research is that kind of relationship between um, how we build our sense of identity and our and construct our memory based on a, a stable set of places, you know, where, where we come from, where our family history is. Uh, and then the effect of um, traumatic displacement on that sense of identity and that sense of memory. Uh, and that's something that's really characteristic of East Central Europe, you know, people being uh, uh, deported en masse, uh, people being, you know, and after the war, obviously, the, this part of, of Europe was really kind of cleaned up, as it were, you know, the states were redrawn and the people were moved. Uh, and those places that are kind of at the, at the center of basically all of your work, um, we can go there sort of physically, geographically, but those places don't exist anymore. Those communities don't exist. You know, those small, the, the shtetls don't exist. Those little, those mixed villages don't exist anymore. Um, so my question really is how, how important is that sense of uh, lost places for all of you and kind of trying to somehow access or travel back to those lost uh, places and also maybe the, the history of displacement and migration that you all have in your own uh, sort of personal or family histories whether you feel that that's had some kind of effect on your desire to um, revisit and rediscover those places. Who'd like to tackle it first? Well, I've, I've spoken quite a lot, so I think that Dennis or Michael should say something. <laughs> Dennis, do, do you want to talk about what Anastasia, do you want to talk about going back to Ukraine? Let's, let, let's start with Anastasia, because obviously she's the youngest, and it's not always easy for you know young people to speak over old people. Because you start with your own thing. Um, just about loss of places and... Well, you know, I haven't, I feel like the places my family, well, I guess because Lviv has, where my family's from, has been Polish and then Ukrainian, then Polish and Ukrainian. So that's quite a complicated thing to tackle. But yeah, I have also thought quite a lot about how, you know, it's quite sad that these communities are gone and they are just appearing in this like loss of history in a way. Um, I find that really interesting. And like, you know, especially with like the World War II population, like they're all kind of dying now. And I find that really sad that a lot of the stories die with them, which I think is kind of why we were motivated to write this book, to kind of get these stories out of um, my great grandparents, my dad's grandparents before they died, which I think we managed to do quite effectively. Um, but no, this sense of loss and um, yeah, loss of immigration. And I always say like, I've been talking quite a lot about to my flatmate, she's, um, she's half Dutch, and about how, um, you know, we're first generation here and how to like raise our children. Like, you know, either way they won't be as Ukrainian as I am or as my parents were. Um, unless move back to Ukraine, and yeah, I do. I've actually been struggling with it quite a lot lately, so it's uh, it's a lot to think about, <laughs> and there's no really easy answer to it. Um, and I think it's because obviously I'm so interested in Ukrainian as a part of yourself that does get lost over time, and you know, being around English people at university and stuff. Um, so yeah, sorry, I haven't really answered that, but um, yeah, no, it's it's it is. I think it's kind of like a thing that you can't really ever solve in yourself, and. Um, uniquely, you know, when those places are gone on when you do have to accept that, but I think the aim is to recover as much as you can from that. Yeah. I wanted just to add a little detail to this answer, which you, which will, um, will will not answer your question, I'm afraid, but uh, it will make it more complex, I think, in a sense that, um, uh, so, so as Matthew and Michael were saying, you know, it, the, the Jewish community is, was really a fundamental part of Galician life for centuries and centuries. And in some towns, uh, they were the, the majority of the population, really, which uh, none of them exist anymore. But, but there are some people from that community who live in the UK, who, amazingly enough, have to thank Russians for their survival. So what happened to that to some of them was when the Russians invaded uh, the west of Ukraine, Galicia, in 39, they deported all bourgeois rich people to Siberia, and some of them went to Kazakhstan even. And I have a friend of mine who's, uh, 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 you know, whose uncle was like that. So essentially, he, he, his money, would, so he was basically stripped of his, all of his assets and sent to Siberia. But then, obviously, two years later, Germans came and they killed everybody. So he actually survived. 
because he'd been deported to Siberia for being a bourgeois uh, person and rich person in Lviv. So I think, uh, can you imagine how complex that would be for him <laughs> to, um, to reconcile uh, probably the most horrendous event in his life with his survival? <laughs> You, Michael, would you like to comment? I was going to just uh, suggest if it was appropriate to screen share, I could show something about what happened when we actually took up the challenge, my father and I, to go back to the address that was on the letter to do something completely out there as father and son um, that we had never have done, never have done anything like that before. And but. I can also just describe it, but the, one of the letters had two addresses on it. And if, Uliam, you are talking about how you as an individual can try to find that connection between identity and displacement. Of course, if you have an artifact and you have something that is personal to you, that's going to motivate you, that you can tangibly look up and find. And I think Matthew found something as also a second generation like myself that he could go back to and actually go back to a village and be, sh and be shown. So that's part of it. You have to make that decision to want to go if it's something that's going to be personal to you. Um, if, if it's for an academic research, you, you will also be motivated to maybe go there for your studies. But because it was personal family history, it was something that was very strongly motivating for us. So we had a document, we had some addresses, we had an address um, of a sender and an address of a recipient. And um, as, as, as the project unfolded and became uh, more compelling for us to understand more, then we were motivated to go to those addresses. So we went to Bella, we went to the address, which is from the sender, from Yosefa, who wrote the letters. I went there uh, in 2017 um, in Kazakhstan and returned again in 2019 uh, with my sister. And I went to Belarus in 2017 with my father. Uh, to the other address that where the letters were sent. And when we arrived at the village um, where these letters were first sent uh, 75 years earlier from this address, uh, two and a half thousand kilometers away, um, it, was, it was like going back in time. So we went back down to this one road, small hamlet of a village that comprised of around 20 houses. And we asked around uh, if there was anyone that would be able to help us. We had uh, someone that was helping us to translate. And there was a bit of um, a few of the, the, the more mature elderly uh, ladies of the village um, were a little bit suspicious at first and kind of stood back. But then they wandered off and they brought back somebody. And this lady that they brought back was, in fact, someone that had a, a direct memory and um, of the in-laws of the family that were our family from that little street in this very tiny village in in current western uh, um, of western belarus and uh we would never have been able to have made that connection and for even my my father would never have gone back to have fit, felt that area where his mother and his family were from if we hadn't have found those artifacts so that is one of the great motivators for wanting to connect all the dots of identity memory and displacement as a result of the events that, that created and shaped the present. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. In your, in your show, you have uh, the border shifting on stage. You, you have a map projected of Poland and you, you literally show how some things disappeared, you know, and were shifted. And with them, of course, people were shifted too. Sure, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the great features, I think, of, of uh, uh, the refugee experience when you when you actually manage to settle somewhere which is safe like my father eventually did was that uh, you look forward and uh, and you protect your children from the kind of uh, awful experiences that you've had and um, so there's an actual kind of willful uh, attempt to kind of erase memory if you like uh, among a lot of uh, refugee communities um, because of the trauma that they've suffered and, uh, and I think that that's perfectly understandable and it's part of human nature, if you like. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, just a, a little anecdote, you know, the very first time I went to uh, Nilovoda, uh, my, my dad's village, which incidentally uh, means rotten water. Um, uh, 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 I went to this beautiful little uh, Orthodox church. Um, there are two churches in the village, this 
fantastic, you know, a really beautiful little wooden church. Um, and uh, I went in there and there was an inscription on the wall um, that had it was about 100 years old, which was basically paying tribute to my great-grandfather, who was also called uh, Mateusz Zajons, and, uh, or Zayats, and um, uh, just sort of thanking him for his support. He's, he was the head man of the village. Our family was the, the richest family in the village, and, uh, and he'd obviously given money to this church, you know, in, in like 1880 or whenever it was. And there was this inscription there, you know, I, I, I videoed it, you know, and I was really quite touched by it. The next time I went to that village, which was about five years later, I went to that church and it had been painted over. And, uh, uh, you know, and I said, what's happened to that? Said, why, why is that happening? It had been there for like 100 years, this inscription, you know. And then I said, oh, we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about it. And I think that there were some people in the village who were concerned that I'd return to reclaim the family's land. Mm. You know? And uh, so, you know, there's... It's part, you know, erasing memory or, or getting rid of memory is something which, unfortunately, uh, William, is part of human nature, it would appear. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's so important to recover these memories and, and to express them and to keep doing it, you know, um, because, you know, of, from, you know, you've got, these are warnings, these kind of things, warnings from history, if you like. And, uh, and we must continue to do that. There's a wonderful uh, um, website called jewishgen.org and, and it has a kind of page, some of you will probably be familiar with it, and it has pages for, for different um, uh, communities that were lost in Galicia, Poland, uh, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, etc. cetera. And uh, um, uh, there's also a, another website I went to, which is uh, about, uh, it's dedicated to the, the former Jewish culture of Pidhaitsi, which was one of those towns you, you referred to, Dennis, uh, um, which uh, was predominantly Jewish before the, the, the Second World War, was essentially a Jewish town. And, and there are pictures of different houses saying whose house this, this was, you know, and... Uh, no, I think that my father's cousin, who was the uh, secretary of the local Communist Party for about 20 years uh, in Pataitsi, lived in one of those houses, you know, so. Um... I think this probably is the perfect moment to begin to wrap up our webinar, the call to uncover stories, ours and those uh, of the communities that, that are not there to to speak for themselves anymore, um, perhaps could become part of our story as well that we can tell. So I'd like to thank one more time Anastasia, Denise, Michael, and Matthew for joining this webinar, for sharing your stories, and all of you for asking your questions. I am very sorry I wasn't able to um, voice all of them, but uh, it just, um, I think it is, you know, perfect excuse for us to gather again and, uh, and keep talking about family histories from East Central Europe.